At the beginning of Harrison II's reign, he had commissioned a mech chassis to be built, one that would stand as the unstoppable image of Harrison I. This is the story of that mech. Hi, hello, and welcome back to Lancer, the mech tabletop RPG, where today we're talking about our first Harrison chassis and the largest playable chassis, Barbarossa. Though you could actually consider it the largest gun you can play. It's kind of both. Fourth on our list, as we alternate different manufacturers and go in alphabetical. So the licenses themselves, when you get license levels within Lancer, it's the equivalent of leveling up, and you can then unlock a portion of a license. The Barbarossa is made up of three, just like all the others. What we're about to talk about is what you get at LL2, as in the main chassis itself. As per usual, here are the general stats of the Barbarossa compared to the Everest, what you get starting out at LL0, or the general standard chassis. Uh, it's very slow. <laughs> but, you know built off of being tanky, some of its additional traits helping it in that realm, and just its guns. It's got lots of guns. The different arrows, you took a picture, screenshot, noted, whatever it is, you got it, you saw it, let's move on. So let's talk about this gun with legs, with its first trait, heavy frame, which means it can't be pushed, pulled, knocked prone, or back by any character smaller than them. There's already an inherent difficulty of trying to knock back someone heavier or larger than you, Barbarossa just makes sure it is even more difficult to impossible. As in if you're smaller, it's not even based off a check, you need to have something else to get around that. Next one playing into its tanky nature, or at least the image of tanky nature, pressure plating, giving it resistance to all explosive damage. Just outright, just a flat resistance. Not something temporary, not activated as ability, you just have a resistance to one of the core damage types. Next trait is Colossus, which allows allied characters to use you as hardcover. <laughs> Cause you know, they just kinda stand behind your legs, don't talk to me or my son ever again, sort of energy. And out of all that good, we have our last, which is slow. Which, outside of movement speed, which it doesn't actually cover, it just gives you a difficulty dice on all agility checks and saves. Because that thing is not doing any tumbles. Or cartwheels, in fact it is just tumbling. The weapon mounts on the Barbarossa are two main and one heavy, cause this thing is going to be packing heat. <laughs> outside of the one integrated weapon which we're about to talk about. But no, Barrage is all day, just slowly walking on the battlefield, a machine god of war. <laughs> I mean, the image is probably overlaid in the background. But yes, with that many mounts, that many of those traits to help reflect it, it is the big lumbering behemoth of the battlefield. To a point that's even called out within lore and even by the people in lore. Various purview essayists decide to use the Barbarossa's slow, bulky nature <laughs> as a comparison for their enemies but it is a lumbering mountain of death. All right, now for the core power, we have... Okay, before actually going to the details of the core power, having it shown up for the moment, uh, it is all the gun. <laughs> it is all the one big gun. <laughs> the gun itself, the apocalypse rail, is something that has been taken and downsized from experimental ship weapons. Not any ship weapon, specifically a spinal weapon, a weapon that takes so long to charge active days to weeks and takes up the entire spine of the ship in length to fire. This is a downsized version of that using exponential gravitic tech. As in, it consistently exponentially increases the gravitic pull at the end of the barrel. <laughs> or something along those lines, railgun but with gravity. Experimental is also the key word. This is not mass produced or rolled out. This is entrusted as a testing phase to pilots and licensed ones. But with that horrifying realization that the Barbarossa can shoot down a ship. <laughs> We're going to move on to its actual stats. Sup, Sylvester here, call sign chest tester, because I always hit my mark on those chest cockpits, and no other reason. And I'm a Lancer who's streaming to you about the newly printed Barbarossa, it's provided and sponsored by Harrison Armory, of course. Though I haven't had time to read through all the different systems, but I heard this gun on its shoulder. Whoa, real doozy. All right, Jerry, what is it? Integrated weapon system, apocalypse rail. Part of the Harrison Armory Plenary Beach Magnitude Weapons Test Project. To use the weapon, the core power charge rail must be used. When activated, you start charging the Barbarossa's Apocalypse Rail. Gain an Apocalypse Die, 1d6 starting at 4. At the start of each of your turns, lower the value of the Apocalypse Die by 1, to a minimum of 1. If you move, even involuntarily, or become stunned or jammed, the Apocalypse Die resets to 4 and then continues to count down as usual. If the value of the Apocalypse Die is 1 through 3, you can attack on your turn with the Apocalypse Rail as a full action. You can't move or take any other actions on the same turn. 
After an attack with the Apocalypse Rail, the Apocalypse Die resets to 4. If you reach the end of the scene without using it, you regain 1 CP. At the end of the scene, you lose the Apocalypse Die and the Apocalypse Rail stops charging. Fucking power hog. The base stats of the Apocalypse Rail are uncharged and you cannot attack targets within 5. Well, don't bother talking about 4, that's just no charge. At Apocalypse Die 3, the range is 20, Blast 2, 2d6 Explosive. Objects within the affected area automatically take 20 AP explosive damage. After the attack, the blast cloud lingers, providing soft cover to characters within the affected area until the end of your turn. Hell yeah! Thank you, Mr. Harrison! Apocalypse Die 2, range of 25, blast 2, 3d6 explosive damage. Objects in terrain in the area automatically take 40 AP explosive damage. A non-hit, characters become shredded and impaired until the end of their next turn. The blast cloud is a burning storm. Until the end of your next turn, characters within the affected area receive soft cover. And characters that start their turn within the area are moved there for the first time in a round. Take 4, burn. Wait, how much the structures? Apocalypse Die 1, range of 30, blast 2, 46 explosive damage. Objects in terrain in the area automatically take 100 AP explosive damage, and characters become shredded and stunned until the end of their next turn on hit. The ground in the affected area is vaporized on impact. The rest of the scene, it is difficult terrain, characters within the affected area receive cut soft cover, and characters that start their turn in the area move there for the first time in a round to take four burn. Dear God. That's the Apocalypse Rail. The Apocalypse Rail is ridiculous. Just ridiculous! It's... <laughs> I mean, it's called the Apocalypse Rail, but still, that is so much damage because to the... Yes, you only do 46. 46 is still a pretty good solid chunk, especially in an area. The evisceration, the burn afterwards as well, the incineration, the entire point staying incinerated for the scene. The amount of heat that has to be there. Not to mention the 100 AP kinetic damage to objects and structures. A building in there? Nope, not lasting. The fact that ships of a certain size category begin counting as structures? When I said this thing could shoot down ships, yeah, sure, small ones would still have the health of general mechs for the general combat rulings and such, but when it comes to a larger class destroyer, you might not be taking it down in one shot. You are shooting through that thing, though. Punch holes in megacities, arcologies, different bases, bunkers, nothing stands a chance when it's a still target. Because after you fire it once, it begins recharging again. The power lasts for the scene. So outside of that craziness, which takes up its own section of the video, <laughs> we have good old LL1. Roller directed payload charges. You good old rolling mine. Two system points, which again, it's not, the image is just a claymore on a hoverboard, but you gotta remember that this thing's the size built for mechs and humans have one hit point. Speaking of that, it can't go into gaps smaller than size one half, so nothing that the goblin can't fit through. Rolls in a line 10 path, bounces over size one objects, or climbs, it doesn't necessarily have to like just leap. And on its path rolling forward, it detonates when hitting or just being adjacent to a different target. And just target, any character, it's not just hostile. It, it will explode in any case. Everyone in the area needs to make an agility save or take 1d6 plus three explosive damage and then be knocked back three spaces in the same direction the mine was going. As the directional charge moves forward and blasts them away, if they didn't just blow up in the first place. However, that's just the roller grenade. There is actually a second version of it called the bouncing mine. Because it's the mine, it's not like the roller charge which then rolls and detonates in any case, the mine itself is planted. Then if anything flies 10 spaces above it or in a space adjacent to 10 spaces above it, the mine leaps up 10 spaces, which by the way, is technically a size 10 object, a little over three times the size of a Barbarossa, requiring the character up there to make a system save or take 2d6 explosive damage and immediately land. Flavored as falling and described as such, but mechanically it doesn't count as falling. While you didn't get that fall damage, they can't fly until the end of their next turn though, which they've already lost their movement by that point. Next one's nice and practical and ready for anyone that wants to stay long range support. Siege stabilizers coming in at one system point and allowing you to be that good old backline support. Not in the sense of healing or repairing or manipulating things on the background, but just being able to shoot farther. With this, you can take a quick action and then decide to plant or retract various bits of stabilizers, which bit of a benefit, bit of a negative. A negative as much as being planted in the one spot sounds. After you plant the siege stabilizers, you have a plus five bonus to range on all ranged weapons, which is pretty nice. However, you then also have the fact you're immobilized, you can't make melee attacks, and you can't attack anything with ranged weapons within five feet. Not five feet, within five range. So essentially, you're not really boosting the range of your total well, weapon, you're just kind of pushing it a little bit that way. With LL2, we begin with something that's nice, simple, and almost anyone would want. 
an autoloader drone. So certain weapons that are large enough and bulky require loading action, essentially taking time to be able to stand still and, you know, recoup it and load it. The autoloader drone you can place down adjacent to you lasts for the full scene, then any allied character can walk up to it, spend a quick action to reload something instead only once per round, but still. Because that's once per round, and if you're the one using the loading weapon, you can kinda just stand there, fire, reload, and be ready the next round. Nothing much else, just nice reloading station. But also because it's deployable and doesn't move, it's playing into the, you're gonna be in the back line or standing still waiting for this gun to fire. <laughs> next we have the flak cannon launcher with two system points, which isn't actually a weapon, it's just an additional system. Choose a flying character within range 15 in line of sight, you shoot flak fire at them, they require an agility save, and if they fail, they fall. Well, they're forced to land, technically flavor-wise fall, technically just land, the whole mechanic thing like last time. The additional bonus though isn't that they just can't fly till the end of their next turn, it's also the fact that they're slowed, which sucks. But hey, not counting as an attack, not taking up a weapon slot, and just swatting things out of the sky. To begin off LL3, we actually have another weapon that's not just the big one. Siege Cannon! <laughs> It's another big gun. <laughs> a super heavy cannon, taking up that heavy slot. Siege cannon has two different modes, siege and direct fire. Siege mode has a range of 30, 3d6 explosive damage within a burst 2 area as, you know, rains down and explodes. What also plays into that is the fact that it has ordnance arcing loading, because it's a giant howitzer, and it's so large with its auto loading systems as well acting at capacity, it gives you heat for, not in damage, but to yourself. With the direct fire mode, you have a range of 20, no longer has a burst, because it's just a single shot, or not single shot, but, well, directed at someone. Still doing 3d6 explosive damage, though. The only different tags, however, are knockback 2 and heat 2. So, half the heat you normally gain from doing the siege mode, and you knock someone back and can fire again immediately instead of having to load. Well, not immediately, but next round. And for our last thing at LL3 is the external ammo feed. Taking up three system points takes a lot. This allows you to, once per round, reload something as a quick action without the need of that different drone. The only downside with this one is, again, the three system points, a heavy cost, but also you take 1d3 plus 1 heat whenever you use it. The external ammo feed itself, described as what it is. While it says system, it even describes it as just like, yeah, you loosely strap bullets to the end of the chassis, an extra battery pack that can then be placed into the weapon itself, various bits of random batteries wired into electrical equipment. It's, uh, very haphazard, which is a funny thing. You'd expect that to be an IAPSN, but especially when we get to Tokugawa, there's a surprising amount of things just strapped onto the outside of it. So you take your license, you pilot it, and you be that unstoppable god of war on the battlefield. Not in brutally getting up close and slaughtering, not taking out pirates, deflecting a bullet here or there. You are tanking, you are moving forward, and you are annihilating anything that is inside. Hi, me again. Here rightfully stealing this Omninet port that I rightfully stole earlier from this nerdy prude. Who in all his chatter, guts, and glory cannot give the Barbarossa the cojones it deserves. Cause this thing's lumbering onto the battlefield. Harrison approved and guaranteed keeping that unstoppable image of the first. And man, it doesn't matter if they even know the word Harrison in the purview. You're gonna blast them to hell anyway. Old temple in the purview? Blown away, doesn't matter if it was from before the fall, that thing isn't standing. Ship trying to go over a no-fly zone, doesn't matter if it's refugees or professional aircraft, that thing's going down. Any bunker, base, wall, any kind of defense trying to stand up to this, some SSC foofy shielding, doesn't fucking matter, this thing's going straight through it. Sure, you might joke that it seems to slowly lumber, but that's because it's carrying the firepower of a ship spool weapon on its back. Do not test the pilot of one of these, cause all of us are itching for a chance to fire. Natural landscape, terrain, cities, buildings, it's not even just the guns or barrages blowing these things up, you're simply walking through these. Not just in the back, but leading the host in the front, as all the different troops around you hanging on to the background, explosive shells trying to hit you, everything being thrown in your direction trying to stop you from charging that shot, cause they know what happens when you get going. And they're only gonna be smears on the fucking pavement! Thank you all for watching, and oh boy, Barbarossa. Big gun, but the rest of the chassis license, useful. Don't get me wrong there, but not really the flashiest within its additional equipment. But I mean, it doesn't need to be flashy with its equipment, it's namely the chassis itself and its core power that's the big flashy thing. I mean, partly literally as well. Part of just the general scope and ridiculousness of bringing a scaled-down ship weapon. 
specifically the massive devastating ones, the spinal weapons. Oh man. Especially if you're using the core power outside of combat, you are blowing away whatever it is, because rounds don't matter. So think about it this way. In combat, yeah, the four rounds kind of stinks, but you can still fire it off before then. Outside of combat, you are almost always doing it at 100 AP damage. So thank you for watching again, thank you to my patrons, and have a nice day. Da 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 da